Rhode Island is a funny place. It's an old state. It's one of the original 13 colonies. And in fact, Rhode Island was the first of the colonies to renounce its allegiance to the British crown. But despite that, the amount of adult American citizens that I've run into in my life who don't know that Rhode Island is a thing is a non-zero number. It's a small state. It's not 50 miles from top to bottom. But despite that, it somehow has over 400 miles of coastline. And combining centuries of United States history with hundreds of miles of coastline, shouldn't come as any surprise that Rhode Island has its fair share of shipwrecks. And recently, my wife and I kayaked out to one of them. It's on a tiny island called Green Island, out in the Narragansett Bay, just off Gaspy Point, in a cove called the Occupus Tuxet. And I didn't really know much about this shipwreck going in. And I guess it was kind of part of the point, but I really didn't even think of researching it until after the fact. And once I started, it became pretty quickly apparent that there were wildly conflicting ideas and opinions on what this wreck was and how it got there and what happened to it. They, they really ranged as broadly as some people saying that it's the Gatsby, the HMS Gatsby itself, and some people saying that it's a wreck from the 1960s, somewhat anticlimactic. But pretty early on in my research, I found two articles that I could tell were going to be pretty foundational, pretty, pretty much a springboard for serious research into this ship. The first was put up by a local newspaper by a guy named John Howell. This article talked about the ship and about Green Island and, and how both the ship and the island are rapidly deteriorating, and how the Rhode Island Marine Archaeology Project, led by Dr. Kathy Abbas, has been sort of documenting that deterioration and really sort of scouring the state, trying to locate and research and document and identify the many shipwrecks that dot the coast. And this article was from 2016. In the other article, the older of the two articles, and in some ways to me the more interesting of the two, was from 2010, and oddly, it didn't have an author attached to it. However, the author of this article not only made some pretty confident claims about what this ship was, but he also apparently has personal memories. He's an older guy, and he has personal memories of these ships from when he was a kid, when they were abandoned, but still more or less intact. I continued my research on this ship, and this article suggested that this particular ship was built by the United States government for the Navy as part of what was called the Emergency Fleet Corporation, which was instituted toward the end, the very end, of World War I, and basically German U-boats had taken such a heavy toll, they would inflicted so much damage on the United States and British Navy that they more or less commandeered American shipyards to rapidly build wooden naval vessels. Now, the Emergency Fleet Corporation was set up at the beginning of 1918. They started manufacturing and delivering ships and sort of by March, April. So it was really the very beginning in 1918 that these, these ships started rolling off the line. However, as we know, World War I ended in November of that same year. And so the vast, vast majority of these ships never saw any combat action during the First World War. And despite building over a thousand of them, most of them were either abandoned or they were recommissioned as other things. And this article said that this particular ship was one of three that made their way to Rhode Island as coal barges in the years shortly after the war. And it went so far as to say that they were manufactured at the Bethesda shipyard in Bethesda, Pennsylvania. Now, 
I developed a couple issues with this. One, this, this ship seemed far smaller than the vast majority built by the Emergency Fleet Corporation. Doesn't mean it's not one. It just means that if it is one, it's one of the less common ships. I mean, this is the, the majority of the ships built by the Emergency Fleet Corporation were hundreds of feet longer than this. Two, the Bethesda shipyard, I couldn't find any record of them building wooden boats. Doesn't mean that they didn't, just means I couldn't find the record online. They just might not be available online. I might have to get in touch with someone. But it was worth it's worth noting that the Bethesda shipyard is a division of Bethesda Steel. Bethesda, Pennsylvania is a steel economy. And lastly, the Emergency Fleet Corporation's records are pretty ready, readily available online. And I couldn't find any record of Bethesda Shipyard having made any ships for them at all. But, right or wrong, the author of this article clearly knows something about these ships that I don't. So, I decided to try and track them down, and I emailed John Howell, the author of the first article. And I asked him, one, if he had any information on these ships, and two, if he knew anything about the author of the other article, the one from 2010. And I told him my suspicions, I told him what I thought. It turns out that he not only knows the article I'm talking about, he knows that it was written by a guy named Henry Brown. And not only that, Henry Brown is a friend of his, and he was able to give me his personal phone number. And in a move that's pretty unusual for me, if you're anybody but my mom, I gave him a call. Hello? Hi, Mr. Brown? Yes, what? <laughs> Hi, I got your uh, name and number from John Howell from the Warwick Beacon. Oh, I sure, okay. He's a good friend of mine. We spoke for, I don't know, about 20 minutes. And by the end of the conversation, he invited my wife and I over to come and take a look at some of his old pictures and old maps and things, and really just kind of pick his brain a little bit more about this shipwreck. And pretty early on in our conversation, my suspicions were confirmed. So apparently his early research into the identity of these ships was incorrect. They weren't World War I. In your article, I'm looking at it now, um, you mentioned that it may have been one of the victory ships constructed at the end of World War II. Well, that was my first, uh, I mean, I just had made a, uh, an assumption, so, because the, uh, during the, uh, that cold winter of 1918, when the Providence River was frozen over, there were barges, numbers of barges that were uh, towed up from uh, Norfolk, Virginia with coal. The Providence was a, had reached a crisis in the, uh, they had depleted the coal supply for Providence in 1918. Wow. So anyway, that's what I assumed it made because they did build those ships for the during the first world war uh they were called victory ships now i found the interesting thing about the barge that uh i didn't realize john howell uh identified the uh it was put together with tunnels you know what a tunnel is i don't did you catch that you know what a tunnel is and for those of you who don't know what a tunnel is and i didn't a tunnel or a tree nail it's a wooden peg, essentially a glorified dowel. And it's used in shipbuilding by boring a hole into the side of a plank and inserting, hammering really, a peg into that hole that's a slightly bigger diameter than the hole itself. And in doing this, the compression of the, the, compression of the peg and of the hole it's been hammered into really almost fuse that peg. You're not getting that out easily. And this technique is used, or was used, in constructing both the hulls and the decks of wooden ships. And it's definitely not a new technique. It was 
wasn't new by any stretch of the imagination at the time this ship was built. In fact, archaeologists have found ships with trunnel construction going back 7,000 years. And I'm not, I'm not saying that this boat is a thousand years older than some people think even the planet is. But it just shows that once a really good technique, once a solid technology was developed, it would tend to persist for a very long time. But this particular ship was constructed not just using trunnels, but also using iron spikes. And that's a technique that was used widely in all sorts of boats, including military vessels, up until about the 1780s. And after the 1780s, it was still used in less expensive, sort of, I guess, less important vessels, like coal barges, up until the 1850s. So that's pretty cool. And I haven't read any serious claims that this boat is actually from the 1700s. Really, it's just speculations of locals who don't know anything about it. And I refuse to believe that anything I arbitrarily select or find or go to research, or that anybody arbitrarily selects, finds, or goes to research, is the first or last of anything. And Henry Brown himself, in our conversation, didn't suggest that it was from the 1700s. So really, we can, we can give a pretty confident estimate at this, at this point that our ship is an early 19th century coal barge. That's kind of awesome, because we went from, what could this be? Maybe it's the Gatsby, maybe it's from 1960. So we had like 200 years of possibility there. And now we know the kind of ship it was and roughly when it was built. And honestly, I don't think we're gonna be able to get much more specific than that. I guess it's possible to get more deeply into it and research the specific boats that were around at that time and narrow it down to the three that made their way down the Providence River and then say it's one of these three built then, then, and then. But it's honestly probably impossible, or at least pretty close to impossible, to, nail, to hammer the date down to really get confidence of the year that this thing was built. So going from more than 200 years to under 50, and knowing what the boat was used for is kind of awesome. But getting back to Henry Brown, I said that he had some personal memories from fairly early childhood about these boats. So the island was 14 acres of land when John Brown, Providence Merchant, purchased the property in 1782. Uh, and uh, there was a little bit of a cold. And sometime in 1926, 20, uh, 25 or 26, uh, a number of three, about three barges were, were abandoned and one to, one was uh, stuck up into this little bit of a cove. Now the barge was destroyed by fire in the night before the 4th of July in uh, 1937. I think it was 1937. You also mentioned that uh, in 1941, your, you and your brother watched the other one? Uh, the... Yeah, and that one burned in the just, just before the Pearl Harbor, around, just around Pearl Harbor time, and uh, it was the uh, first, first week of December or something, and, and uh, now there was a, uh, uh, there was a, a friend of mine, he was a uh, paper boy, and he used to deliver the papers, and he said, uh, this, this, Today is the uh, 80th anniversary of the of the hurricane, yep. 1938. Okay, yeah. And he said, when he was a boy, 
delivering papers. He said, that afternoon I delivered papers. And I said, well, how, how did you get there? And he said, you know, he said, well, he walked down the bank and he said the, uh, there was a step ladder and the ladder, and he had to climb the ladder to throw the paper up on top of the, uh, the doghouse. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> So that is also kind of awesome. That's, that's a first-hand account. This isn't hearsay. This is, that's Henry Brown himself telling us about his childhood through the 30s and 40s, about growing up around these boats. And he remembers in 1937 and 1941 them being torched. Maybe a 4th of July celebration, maybe an act of vandalism, whatever. That's, that's a first-hand account, eyewitness account, of what happened to these ships. But whatever the case, and for better or worse, here we are. We're researching this shipwreck sitting on this tiny island originally purchased by John Brown just a few years after the American Revolution. And we visited one of his descendants who shared personal stories, eyewitness accounts, Photographs, maps, all sorts of things related not just to this ship, but to Rhode Island and really United States history overall. And that's kind of incredible. This is just us saying, hey, we should start kayaking again. Let's go check out this shipwreck I heard about. I didn't really know anything about it, and it was after the fact that I decided to look into it. But that's the point of pedal powered anthropology. It really goes to the heart of why I started it to sort of take whatever it is you're up to and delve a bit more deeply and keep that sort of antenna up in whatever it is that you do. So that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to click like and to subscribe to this channel. And if you're local and you're interested in getting involved with the Rhode Island Marine Archaeology Project, I'm going to include contact information for them, both in the description below this video and somewhere in the credit rolls that's about to come up. And I'm also going to include links to my website and to the various other Peril Powered Anthropology uh, social media feeds so that you can get all the anthro spin that you want. And if you're interested and potentially able, you'll also be able to financially contribute to my work, which is always appreciated. And as always, there will also be all of the equipment and uh, software that I use to film and edit this. So that way you can go out and do it yourself. Thanks for watching. Just wait a second, I'm going over a break. I have no idea where you live. Um, 